I'm Sarah Canny, and this is my live Instagram show, Showing Up, Courageous Conversations with Women Who Are Following Their Heart. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Canny, and this is my Instagram live show called Showing Up. I hope that you are having a fantastic Wednesday. Um, it's a gorgeous day in here in New Hampshire, so I thought we'd come outside. Um, so there might be a little bit of background noise going on, and I keep getting interrupted saying it's having a poor connection, but we're just going to go with it and see um, see if it hangs on. So um, I initially started this show because I really wanted to have conversations with women who were following their heart and um, pursuing their passion despite any obstacles or setbacks they encountered. And um, throughout the, this is episode 13, and throughout all these episodes, um, just found some really uh, great stories that are really inspiring. Um, Stories of women who are um, sort of navigating what it means to um, really to pursue your passion and um, yeah. I'm having a major brain like blanks today, so you'll have to bear with me as we move forward, um, which is, you know, the fun of a fun of a live show. So thanks to those who are um, who are with me today. Um, I'm really excited to bring on uh, Rebecca Stanfield McGowan today. She is the director of National Park Stewardship at the Billings or Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Park in Woodstock, Vermont. Um, and she also is has been on staff at Rise Run Retreat the last two years and have had a chance to get to know her. Um, and I think one of the things that I've observed about her um, is that when we go out for our Saturday run, which is through the park, um, that she where she works in the lands that she manages, she just lights up um, as she talks about the history of the park and um, kind of what we're what we're running through. Um, and so she's someone who I've encountered who's just really passionate about what she does um, with the National Park Service and um, really engaged with her career. And so um, I wanted to go ahead and bring her on and um, talk to her about um, has gotten to where she is, um, what she loves about what she does, and kind of what keeps her... Um, inspired and moving forward how are you i'm doing great i'm Good. glad that you said that you're brain this morning because i'm feeling that way too yeah yeah it's just one of those one of those mornings where i just like the thoughts are there but the words and the thoughts aren't making a connection to come out of my mouth the way yeah. i want to do <laughs> that happens well, I um, kind of gave a super brief background um, for you, um, but there's so much more that I'm leaving out. So for those, for the people who are watching who aren't familiar with you, maybe you could give us just a little bit of a background on um, your career, sort of the national, how you got into working for the national yeah. parks and, and where you are now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, in the middle of the city, and my summers were spent either at summer camp or um, a very close family friend owned a ranch in Wyoming. So I had this nice juxtaposition of urban environment and then nature in the summer. Um, and that really formed who I was. I had parents who really encouraged the like, go out, try new things, explore new things. Um, and I really thought I wanted to be a camp counselor. I loved youth outdoors, the experiences that you got to have when you were at summer camp. And I went to my first college, because there were a couple of them, um, and thought that like art education or maybe kinesiology, something, one of those very different things, chemistry even, would be the place to to just get that sort of college education and then go into summer camp. And then I found out that there's this major called Parks and Recreation. And that just blew my mind and completely changed my path. Um, and so I ended up exploring Parks and Recreation, 
getting really connected to the National Park Service and the ideals that it represents for the mm -hmm. for the country. This democracy of protecting lands for future generations for everybody that no other country really had until the United States did it and really used it as a symbol of democracy. And I just loved that. Mm -hmm. And I loved the idea that it was a place of education and that anyone should have access to this place to learn about parks, to learn about the history of the country, natural and cultural, and you know all of the people that come together to make America great. Just really, it's like this is this is the place to be. Yeah, um, and it's I so exciting when you describe it like that. It's like the like you could hear like the montage and the orchestra in the background. Like it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's mm -hmm. such a neat thing that we have that I think a lot of people don't think about. Yeah, and I mean, the idea has definitely evolved over the, you know, over 100 years that the Park Service has been around and that national parks have been around. And um, we've learned a lot about what types of places to manage and protect and how to manage and protect them. But this basic principle of protecting places so that they're there for everyone to experience them and share in that sort of collective identity that we, we create um, as a country mm -hmm. is is really special. And I feel really lucky that I have been able to kind of transition from an academic environment um, that I was in for several years to actually getting to work with the Park Service and with communities, um, helping to support public land managers and partners and people doing that great work. That's amazing. So what is your role now and like what are your primary responsibility? So my role now is I am the director of the National Park Service Stewardship Institute. And so that is based at Marsh Billings Rockefeller um, in Woods, Vermont. And so as the director of that institute, I focus on supporting collaboration and engagement across the Park Service um, nationally. So both at Marsh Billings um, and our sister park, St. Gaudens, which is in New Hampshire, um, but also across the service. So I have an opportunity to travel and see lots of just amazing places. Um, leadership development is a really key component of the work. So looking at how we support leaders in park management is um, a big focus. And then a little bit of that evaluation and sort of study goes in there to make sure that we're incorporating best practices and really tracking our impact. Um, so I, I feel like I get the best of both worlds. I am in a beautiful place and I get to work with the land managers and support the management of this beautiful place in Vermont. Um, but then I get to travel all over the country and work with mm -hmm. Park Service staff and their communities all over the country. Yeah, that's amazing. It sounds like um, just such a neat opportunity to come in contact with, um, you know, different people who are in your field, but then um, the communities that you're going into as well. Um, as when you were sort of in school and um, kind of looking at your options of, kind of where you would go and what you would do. Um, did you ever kind of question or do you, did you encounter any obstacles as you were trying to decide like what your specialty was or um, what you were, where you were going to end up? Mm -hmm. So one of the main things that really has been a driving force for me in my work has been increasing the participation of people of color. So in my all the way through school and I did, you know, undergrad, a master's, a PhD, all of it. There were very few people of color and just very few women of color. So and there are a lot of barriers and challenges and insecurities about whether you belong there. And then being a person of color from an urban area who is like, I don't want to say this, but I kind of don't like camping. <laughs> not comfortable. Um, so there's a lot of self insecurity about mm. trying to be like, I do belong in the park service, mm. I do belong in natural resources, because I, I, there are pieces of it that I absolutely love. And I'm learning to like camping now that I have a kid. Um, so some of it was, you know, trying to find um, role models and people mm. that I could look up to 
that had similar backgrounds to me or came from similar locations um, that I could really relate to. Um, and then entering the federal workforce um, for the Park Service can be pretty challenging. And so you have to be pretty persistent and um, be willing to, to be in it for the long haul in terms of a, setting up a process for, for getting that job. And so a lot of my academic work was working with the Park Service that allowed me several years to build a relationship Mm -hmm. um, with folks in the Park Service, which was really critical to being able to identify when a job opening came and um, aligning my skill sets to it. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about that fe those feelings of insecurity and kind of how did you how did you deal with that sort of internal negative voice? And mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned that there were a few people that you kind of looked to as role models and. Like, in what way did you find encouragement through them? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, my coping mechanism in the beginning was education. I'm going to know more about whatever topic I'm studying than anybody else. And I'm going to be able to speak about it more than anybody else. So I belong because I have a strong foundation in the basic academic research or literature. Um, and as I've advanced in my career, I've, focus more on, I have the passion. Um, I don't actually know everything. There's, I've um, been moving into new fields um, in my work that I need to count on experts from outside the park service or other people to help, help me build those skills or to help me communicate what I want. But I now have, you know, 10 years of experience and that says something. Um, so trying to constantly remind myself that like, no, you've been doing this for 10 years, you have legitimate things to say. Um, mm. And you don't have to have all the answers you can ask. You can ask the questions. Um, and the people that I looked up to, there were a lot of um, like, getting close to retirement aged uh, men that were actually really supportive of my career when I first uh, moved into it. And so that was really, um, I'm not sure if empowering is the right word, but it was really nice to see, you know, not a group that I would nat naturally gravitate towards mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. mentors and to be those mm -hmm. supporters, but mm -hmm. were really encouraging about, mm -hmm. you know, you are who the Park Service needs to be hiring. You know, this younger, diverse group needs to be coming in and taking on the jobs that we are leaving. Um, and so being around people that were able to clearly articulate some of the shifts that they saw needing to happen within the Park Service and being supportive um, was really important. And then a couple key females that just showed you how to like own it and speak <laughs> your truth and just right. be powerful and be honest mm -hmm. um, and willing to call people out when they were doing things that they didn't agree with and in nice ways um, was really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great how when encouragement comes from an unexpected place, it almost feels a little bit even more encouraging because it <laughs> sort of reaffirms and assures you in a, in a way that you weren't expecting. So mm -hmm. that's really yeah. neat. That you're able to find that encouragement mm -hmm. there. Um, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, now that you have 10 years of experience and I feel like the older I get, the more <laughs> magical, like the numbers become because you're like, oh, I've been doing this for 10 years. Like that's, I'm legit, you know? Um, but earlier on, like in year two or year three, five, like what were, how did you navigate some of those, those obstacles or maybe mm -hmm. doubts that you were feeling earlier on? Um, mm -hmm to kind of keep yourself on track and, and keep pursuing, you know, this passion of yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, and thinking back, is the Institute fresh out of uh, the academic world. So I came in with a very different research focused perspective. And so those first couple of years, I definitely kind of kept quiet um, mm -hmm. and, in meetings would just like be the observer. Um, and then every once in a while, ask a question or um, have a comment. Um, 
but I really did try to listen as much as possible. I think that was coming from my academic background um, mm -hmm. to really listen and, and take notes, basically mental notes and to watch what people were doing around me and how they were interacting and how the structure of the park service worked. Um, mainly so that I was like filing it away so that I knew once my confidence was a little bit more um, and I've always been fairly confident so it's not like I'm a shy person um, but once I felt like I had a little bit um, authority or seniority to to speak I knew the lanes and how things worked because it is important in I think any organization in the park service to understand like how people are working together and who talks to whom and um, to spend some time figuring that out um, so for me, I would say those first, I had a fantastic boss for the first couple of years, was observing and listening and, you know, keeping that sort of student mindset. Um, and then when it came time for me to step into a role of leadership, um, it was, it was kind of challenging to make that shift, to go from, it's no longer me saying, well, would you like me to do this? I'm thinking that this might be a good idea to, this is what I would like us to do. Mm. Let's all figure out together how we get there. Um, that was a little bit harder, but from having spent a couple of years really like trying to study and learn the work environment, I think that it gave me more confidence moving into the leadership role. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a really interesting and difficult shift from like feeling like you're competent and confident, but then moving into, well, or stepping into I'm a, I'm a leader and mm -hmm. taking on that identity and kind of owning that can be a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what are some of the things that have helped you um, really take on that identity? Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, so Margaret Wheatley is, um, A guru. She's amazing. And so I um, got to spend a couple of years working closely with her and I highly recommend reading sort of any of, of her books. Um, and so uh, there actually was a lot of like self work in terms of what type of leader do I want to be and um, being a servant leader. And that means playing to my strengths, not trying to be like commanding and this is what we need to do and I'm going to micromanage, but to look f with compassion to what are the skill sets of the people around me and trying to support those and connect those, which um, was something that I had been doing before, but not as a leader. Um, and so really thinking, who are the people that I work with? And what are their passions, their skills, and how do I actually support that um, versus just delegating and trying to get stuff done? And so having the ability to think, you know, holistically about the projects that we work on and not just, we need to get this done, so I'm going to put someone in charge of it, but mm -hmm. we need to get this done and who has a passion that's going to make it even better than I could make it um, and then identifying those, those people and, and, you know, empowering them to do it. And it, it's not easy. Like one of the things that I have really struggled with um, is that I manage mostly people that are older than me and have been working in the park service longer than I have. Um, and so trying to be a leader in that dynamic is, I'm still struggling with that because I know what motivates me as someone who is in my late thirties with a young family and what I need to do. And then trying to be empathetic and understand what motivates someone else in a completely different space in their life. Uh, is, mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to build that sort of bridge of connection um, when I'm thinking, but this is what would get me really excited. And it's not for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so a lot of your job is sort of managing people and connecting with people. I mean, on the whole, you're stewarding public lands, but then, I mean, really it's, you know, in order to do that, you're, you're working really closely with, with people. Um, 
to get them on board with what you're doing. Um, what are some of the tools that you've kind of encountered that have been really helpful for you in, as you mentioned, like kind of looking in within and developing yourself as a leader and finding your leading style and what things have you used to, to help you in that way? Mm -hmm. So I definitely try to um, stay in touch with my emotions. And um, there's a lot of assessments, like personality assessments that um, I've done in leadership trainings. And um, I really think that the most useful one um, looks at, you know, when you are aware of your emotions and how they're hitting you. Um, and so in any meeting, when I start to have a reaction to take that moment and actually think like, okay, why am I starting to get all sweaty? Like, why am I getting tense? And then what, what am I telling myself is happening? Um, am I going up the ladder of inference and assuming that this person has horrible intentions when really they aren't even thinking about what they're saying because their mind's someplace else? Um, and so really like taking that step back and letting myself take the moment to be like, okay, I'm feeling frustrated and I'm frustrated because X, Y, and Z is not happening. Is it not happening because the person doesn't want to do it or can't do it? Or is it not happening because I wasn't clear about what my expectations are and what part of this do I own and how do I then address it? Um, and it's hard to do that in the moment, um, mm. but it has been really helpful for me to be like, okay, because I can't let these emotions just continue on and carry on. Um, mm -hmm. I need to be able to address it as it's happening and move forward. Um, so I do that so many times during the day. And when I find myself replaying conversations over and over again in my head, I'm like, it's time to stop. Like, what do I actually, what, what, what am I? telling myself about what I think this person's intentions are and how can I actually find out what really happened um, to stop doing that or if it's something that I need to clarify. Um, so for me, a lot of it is really that like self-knowledge and then communication, just constantly working on, am I being clear? Am I communicating with people um, the best that I can to get across my intentions? Um, and am I giving them an opportunity to ensure that I understand their intentions? Yeah, I think that's such an important skill for life. I mean, it applies to not just to work scenario, but to your relationships, to parenting, like it can be applied to pretty much every aspect of life that is kind of slowing down identifying what you're feeling. And then mm -hmm. the thing that I always come back to is like asking myself, well, what's the story that I'm telling myself yes. <laughs> about what's going on? Like what's, mm -hmm. what am, what's the story that I'm making up and is it true? And um, yeah, I think that's, that's such a um, critical skill to have, you know, in, a, in any scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you mentioned that you have a young family um, mm -hmm. and you know, you're traveling a lot. And so how, what does, I know everyone uses the word balance, but like, what does your work life family kind of integration look like mm -hmm. in terms of, um, traveling and, you know, staying passionate about your job and staying, yeah. you know, fitted and engaged mm -hmm. with your family, but how do you, what's your philosophy and how do you approach mm -hmm. that? So my philosophy is not balanced because I'm never going to be balanced because that is something that you tweak something and all of a sudden you're out of balance. I really focus on priorities and my priorities shift based on, you know, the day, the week, what's happening at work, what's happening at home. Um, and I'm still trying to really figure it out. If anyone ever gets it figured out, I have a fantastic husband who really helps make it possible and um, does most of the like daily school drop off school pickup. Um, one thing that is fantastic about working for the National Park Service is that it is a family focused type of environment. That's so 
bringing your kid to work events. Um, when he was a baby and I was nursing, him and my husband would travel with me um, on work trips so that I didn't have to leave him home and worry about where am I going to pump milk and how am I going to get it back to them and do you yeah. just toss it? Um, he's eight years old, so I don't remember if there were like milk delivery systems back then. Um, so I have a really supportive work environment that has been great. Um, one thing that has changed in the past couple months um, as a result of the government shutdown and being out of work for 35 days, which was stressful um, on its own, but the silver lining that I got from it was I was home for 35 days with my family. I took my kid to school in the morning. I picked him up in the afternoon, things that I have literally never done on a regular basis. Last year, I took him to school in January and I didn't know the drop-off routine. So this has been really, it was a really different experience. Um, mm -hmm. And he had a snow day and I was home. And normally if he has a snow day, I will stay home from work and I will telework a little bit, um, you know, answer emails, do whatever conference calls I had planned and try to like, put him in front of a TV or, you know, get him outside with the neighbors while I'm doing work. And this time, since I had no work, we played together. Um, we went outside and played together. We made hot chocolate and it clicked that when I'm home, I should be home and that I had been home physically, but mentally I was always on my computer mm -hmm. or always on my work phone. And yeah. no one needs me to check emails at, 9.30 at night or at 5.30 in the morning. It's just not necessary unless there's like something big happening at work. Um, so I've really been making a conscious effort since then to be home when I'm home, to put the work phone away, to not have the work computer out on the dining room table constantly, um, to be present. And I really truly thought that I was like, I knew that I physically mm -hmm. was not, you know, participating in all of the parent stuff, but I was the one that stayed home when he was sick and stayed home on snow days, but it just didn't occur to me that I wasn't actually there. I was mm -hmm. just a grown up in the house so that he wasn't yeah. alone. Um, so that was, that was a real wake up call. And it's something that I'm really working on. It's still, you know, every once in a while is hard to do, um, but I'm really trying. Yeah. I, it's tough. Like, I think that's something that I definitely um, struggle with too, is like being physically present, but mentally being somewhere else, whether it's on the computer or on the phone. And it's actually something that my husband does really well. <laughs> so it's good that one of us is, is good at it, but mm -hmm. he's really good about just like really compartmentalizing, like work is work, like he comes home. If he has like phone calls or anything, he sits out in his truck and finishes them so that when he walks in the door, he can turn his phone off and like be totally present. And um, yeah, I think it's something that, um, that we can, I am sure that there are more than us who um, <laughs> that mm -hmm. gentle reminder to like, be mentally present as well as physically present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. So what are some of the things that um, that you do kind of to aside from work that you're passionate about that sort of bring you happiness and, and joy and um, in a way also help you maintain your passion for your career? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, running, how, how we got connected is like the other it's more than half my life, the other like huge chunk of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I started running when I was in grad school and needed to do something physical and um, realized that I traveled a lot for research, but I went to travel to beautiful places. I was doing my research in national parks. So what better way to not be sitting in front of a computer all day and to then be able to explore these beautiful mm -hmm. places. Um, so I love being able to use running to explore wherever I'm traveling, since I travel so much, getting to go out and see more of either the city or the park, wherever I am. Um, mm -hmm. And I run pretty much every morning, um, really early, you know, 5 a.m., 5.30, um, with a solid group of friends. And it's when I don't make that morning run, um, it 
kind of it changes my personality a little bit. Like I need to, I need that morning run. I need that, you know, 50 minutes, um, mm -hmm. first thing in the morning, you know, wake up, the house is quiet. Um, mm -hmm. everyone else is asleep and being able to, you know, quickly pack my bag, not even make coffee, just like slip out the door and see the sunrise. Um, mm -hmm. And just talk with my friends who, you know, all of us have crazy hectic jobs, work ridiculous hours. Um, we run early in the morning because one of us routinely has meetings at 730 in the morning. So in order for us to actually get together and do it, it sometimes we meet at four. Yeah, sometimes we're meeting at 430 just so that it fits with everyone's schedule. That's great. And it just like that that feeds me and the community that I've met through running has is I when I started running I never would have thought that mm -hmm. um, the friends that I've made would be you know so important to my life mm -hmm. I was just reflecting with one of them today that we only met three years ago which just seems insane because I feel like I've known her my entire life yeah yeah it's really uh, the connection that comes from the running community is pretty special mm -hmm. so so looking ahead, what what goals do you have for your for your career? Where do you see yourself kind of moving forward? Yeah, um, so there are a couple of um, projects that I am currently working on that I am excited about and want to see through um, here at the Institute that are really looking at supporting Park Service staff as we deal with some really challenging issues of harassment and hostility within the workforce. Um, so it's sort of a new field. It's very emotional talking about trauma and harm a lot, um, but really interested in how we can integrate some um, interesting principles into our response and support of, of employees. So um, one of my big goals is to get more conversant and have a better understanding of trauma-informed organizations. And so that has been sort of a, a heavy lift that I have taken on over the past couple of months and to dive into that field and make some connections with folks there. Um, I think ultimately, I mean, I love where I am and I love the Institute. So I don't actually think that far out into like in five years, 10 years, where do I want to be career wise? Um, I've been lucky that timing has worked and things have appeared when I've been ready to make a shift. Um, mm -hmm. And in the park service, I feel like that, that happens. Jobs appear, um, not magically, but like when you are ready, um, you can, you can find a way to make that shift. Um, so we'll, we'll see what, what happens in the future. I mean, I have lots of running goals and goals for everything else. It's just like my career is the one place where I'm like, mm -hmm. I have lots of interesting things happening and I want to see them through. And yeah. my, my, like the, the focus will shift and change and mm -hmm. hopefully it'll lead me down some really interesting roads mm -hmm. that I haven't been down before. And mm -hmm. we'll see where that goes. I mean, I'm, I'm fully committed to the park service until I get that 35 year pin and get to retire into my yeah. dream beach bungalow house somewhere. But. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like you're right where you want to be and mm -hmm. with the ability to pursue projects and, and things that, that really excite you and, and have a really important impact. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's say I feel really lucky and blessed to be, um, where I am right now and to be able to mm -hmm. do the work that I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there are ebbs and flows with, you know, the priorities and, and where we focus. And sometimes things are super like high energy and high focus. And sometimes it's a, it's a struggle to get people to, to align with your priorities, mm -hmm. and what you think is mm -hmm. important. Um, but being able to identify some of the things that I'm super passionate about and then be able to make that my job is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's really special. Mm -hmm. So if, if people want to follow along with you or if, where can they find you? Um, if you want to be found <laughs> on, the, on social media or, yeah. um, or if they want to come and visit um, mm -hmm. the, the Marsh Billings Rockefeller park where you are at, tell us yeah. a little bit about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am on Instagram. So it's re underscore Becky. Becky with an E-Y. Um, when, don't ask why. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm pretty active there. It's mostly running in a little bit of my travels and a lot of my kids. Um, Marsh Billings Rockefeller is in Woodstock, Vermont, and it is a beautiful time to be in mm -hmm. Woodstock. So um, I'd highly encourage you to come up and visit Woodstock. There are also 419 other units of the National Park Service. So there's probably one close to wherever you are, um, anyone that's watching, uh, that you can visit. But Marsh Billings Rockefeller and St. Gaudens National Historical Park, um, really close together so two great places and if you come to marsh billings you will most likely if i'm not traveling find me in the carriage barn on the second floor sitting in front of the computer <laughs> fantastic well thank you rebecca so much for joining me today this was fun to to just hear more about you and, and all the things that you are doing to um help take care of our public lands so all right thank you for inviting me this was great to get to chat yeah all right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You as well. Thanks for joining me today, guys. I um, just have a lot of fun hearing um, the stories of other women who are stepping into leadership roles, um, overcoming obstacles, you know, some of the obstacles that, that Rebecca mentioned, um, and just finding, finding a place um, for themselves and for their unique skills and giftings and passions. So um, this, there's black flies everywhere. <laughs> um, this has been really fun. Um, next week, um, I won't be coming on. I'm actually going to take a break for the summer from this Instagram live show um, so that I can show up for my kids and be present over the summer. Um, I, on nice days like this, we like to pack up the car and head to the lake or the beach or just do spontaneous fun things when the weather is good. So when you've got a live show obligation that's smack dab in the middle of the day, um, it can kind of inhibit that. So the great thing about starting your own thing and doing your own thing is that you get to manage and choose what you do with it. So um, we're going to take a break from showing up for the summer. I will probably still be coming on occasionally, um, showing up on Instagram live throughout the week just to be in touch. Um, but we'll pick back up in the fall with um, some more guests who are already lined up and really excited to be on. So I hope you guys enjoy your summer and we'll see you in the Instagram stories um, over the course of the next few months. Enjoy the rest of your day.